So thank you for attending this last seminar this semester in our series, Future Leaders in Robotics and AI, Celebrating Diversity and Innovation Seminar Series, which is sponsored by Microsoft DC Metro Engineering site. And we are very glad to have with us today, Rohan Chandra, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas, Austin, with Dr. Joy Dippiswas and Peter Stone, Dr. Peter Stone. And some of you may know Rohan, he's not new to Maryland because he completed his MS and PhD in 2018 and 2022 from the University of Maryland with Professor Dinette. Shmanotja. His doctoral thesis was on autonomous driving in dense, heterogeneous, and unstructured traffic environments. And Rohan has already a lot under his belt. He's a Microsoft future leader in robotics and AI, a Kaust Rising Star in AI. 2023, a UMD21 Future Faculty Fellow, and an RSS22 Pioneer. And he's a recipient of the UMD20 Summer Research Fellowship. He's active in the fields of computer vision and robotics and publishes intensively in the conferences in these fields and in the workshop. And his current work is on multi-agent social navigation and planning in unstructured and challenging environments. So, Rohan, will, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Cornelia. Let me just share my screen. Um, okay. Can everyone see my screen? I think it's still loading. All right, thanks. So, all right. So, yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Cornelia. Thanks, uh, Yancy, for, for hosting me. Uh, so, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at this series. It's uh, wonderful to be also back at UMD, even if virtually. So, today I'm going to talk about socially compliant multi agent planning and navigation in challenging environments. So on this slide, you can see a GIF on the left. You can see like a video or a GIF of uh, one of our uh, algorithms, one of our works that's operating in simulation. So you have all these agents that are going from the left side of the room to the right side, connected by a very narrow doorway or a narrow tunnel. The green region denotes the conflict area. And you can see that all of these agents have to emerge in a, in a Q formation or a line formation in order to be able to go through this uh, narrow door. Uh, just, just like humans do. And the same thing on the right that you can see, you can see two robots. One is a spot, Boston Dynamics spot robot, and the other is a jackal robot. And the task is the same. They, they start from an equidistant position from the, from the makeshift doorway, and they have to go through the narrow gap in a way that, that respects right of way, respects uh, collision avoidance, and other kinds of uh, social rules that humans are so good at uh, obeying. So these are the kind of emergent behaviors that we are interested in and we are uh, working on. So the agenda for today, I'm going to start by motivating the problem, what is social navigation and some of the challenges that social nav navigation contains. I'm going to uh, define social navigation because I feel that uh, there's a lot of confusion and ambiguity about the definition of social navigation. Like navigation is a very formal, formal concept. Navigation is very well understood, but social navigation is not so well understood. And I feel that, you know, because it's becoming a, a very important and prominent uh, research area. So in order to go further into social navigation, we need to understand a formal definition of social navigation. So this is where I will spend the bulk of my time. Then I will uh, briefly talk about some uh, approaches that uh, um, me and my colleagues are taking and then some preliminary results. And finally, I will conclude by summarizing the work that I've talked about in today's presentation and outlining some directions for future work. Okay. So with that out of the way, let's start with motivating. So some of the most important and um, exciting applications of robotics are those where robots have to, have to interact with humans very closely and have to coexist with humans in the same shared space. 
So this includes autonomous driving, last mile delivery, personal home robots, and so on. But despite the progress and uh, importance of, of these applications, we're still not in a position where we can confidently and safely deploy these robots in these, in these kinds of environments. And some of the challenges that we still have to contend with are that we have to prevent collisions, we have to prevent deadlocks, and we also have to ensure social compliance. So what are some of these things? So what is collisions is self-explanatory. We don't want robots to hit other robots or other humans. A deadlock is when a robot has not reached its goal, but it does not have any viable action left. It does not have any action left that it can take that will uh, keep it safe. So in a way you can think of the robot as being stuck. And social compliance is a little bit tricky, tricky to talk about because there's no definition of social compliance. But when we talk about social compliance, um, we think about, you know, when we think the, the th when we think about social compliance, we think about this set of social norms or set of social rules that humans have to abide by in a civilized society. So this could include uh, negotiating right of way rules, passing on the right or left, depending on where you live. Um, don't cut in front of other humans, be respectful. These kinds of social norms that humans are humans imbibe. And in an ideal world, we want robots to be able to imbibe these same social rules. Now, why are these challenges particularly hard to address? What is so difficult about addressing these challenges? The difficulty arises when, when you're dealing with multi-agent scenarios or multi-agent cases, then the optimal action that a robot has to take, the optimal policy, depends on the actions and the intentions of the other agents. And that is typically not known, not visible to, the, to, 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 to a robot. So when you have to compute your optimal action and you don't know the optimal actions of what the other uh, agent is going to do, that creates um, uh, challenges in the sense of, you know, you can't predict what the other, other agent is going to do. So if you're moving too fast, if you're going trying to go through a narrow doorway and you don't know what the guy next to you is going to do, if, you're, if your robot is moving too fast, you may collide. If you're moving too slow, then you may enter a deadlock, right? So these kinds of challenges are already present in scenarios or applications like autonomous driving or last mile delivery, but they become more prominent in social uh, navigation scenarios where the space may be constrained. So, so that brings me to my research question. How can we make robots navigate safely, efficiently, and in a socially compliant way in shared human spaces? And this research question is purposefully kept very, very general, very, very broad, because there are, there are a range of uh, approaches or ways in which one can tackle this research question. You can think of this research question from the perception aspect, where you think about you know computer vision and deep learning and try to make sense of the scene and the surroundings around you. You can think of this from the prediction or the planning perspective, where you're trying to compute an optimal policy given the perception input. Or you can think of this from the human factor side. You can think of it from human robot interaction side or human behavior modeling, where you're trying to model the behavior of, of different, different humans. And in my thesis, I tackled that research question from, from all the aspects. I worked on perception, prediction, planning, and behavior modeling, but very specifically to the case of autonomous driving. So I won't go into my thesis at all in this uh, talk, but this is like a one slide snapshot summary where I studied autonomous driving in traffic that is uh, very dense, very heterogeneous, and where agents don't follow traffic rules, right? And uh, a link to the thesis can be found below, so you can check that out. Um, but here I, I, I uh, studied, you know, if you, if you put autonomous driving in very, very unstructured surroundings and what are some ways in which you can, you can try to model the, this un unstructuredness and this, and this chaos that happens in, in, uh, let's say developing countries like India, and then use that to, to push or not push, but, uh, extend autonomous driving in, in, in those directions. And now in my postdoc, I'm zooming out a little bit. Right from a PhD, I did specifically autonomous driving, but now I'm zooming out from autonomous driving to more general purpose uh, mobile robotics. Right. So now what I want to do is, right. so now what I want to do is I want to define that was that was the motivation. So I'm done with motivation. Now I want to define what I mean by a social navigation problem. Right and before I get to a social navigation problem, I want to be able to, I want to uh, ground the definition. I want to be able to provide a very formal definition for social navigation uh, that, that, that one can use and you know, conduct future research on. 
So a good starting point is uh, the standard navigation problem. So the tuple that I'm showing on this slide or the navigation problem that I'm going to uh, explain here is, is perhaps as general as you can get. And this is a very general uh, navigation problem for, from first principles. And so this is a good starting point. Starting from here, I'm going to then define what social navigation is going to be. So let's first start with multi-agent navigation. So multi-agent navigation can be described by this tuple. Here, K refers to the number of agents. It is an integer. T is a finite horizon. It is also an integer. And uh, uh, yes, we use, so I am I'm assuming finite horizon, but you know, for reinforcement learning people, you can think of this as gamma is equals to one. Um, state space, action space are finite continuous. Uh, the state space has two subsets, xi, xg, where xi, xg uh, contains the initial points and the goal points of the robot. And for simplicity, we can think of these as singleton sets. So each robot has a single start point and a single goal point. The action space is specific to each robot. Uh, so depending on the kinodynamics of each robot, we don't assume them to be same. Each robot can have their own kinodynamic constraints. So this can uh, result in different kinds of action spaces. Uh, so that is indexed by I. So I indexes over all the robots. And this is finite and continuous. So now the very important uh, variable is the set of preferred trajectories, which is gamma I tilde. This is a set of trajectories which is which a robot would have taken had there been no other obstacle, static, dynamic, or other agents in the scene. So, so what we do is we, we take a robot and we leave the robot to its own device. And we say that here's your start point, here's a goal point, and there is nothing else in the scene. You go as you see fit. This is go according to your optimal trajectory. So the, so the robot can take the min path, it can take the min jerk trajectory, it can take whatever trajectory it wants. That will be its preferred trajectory. And that we will, uh, uh, put in, in this variable called gamma i tilde. That is a set of preferred trajectories. The transition function uh, is this curly t, and uh, it is uh, it, it respects the obeys the kinodynamic constraints. So it picks a state of a robot. It takes the action that the robot will take from that state, and it spits out the next state, which the robot will land into. And because we are general, we don't assume full observability of the state space. So we have an observation function. And uh, we have an observation space. So observation function also takes in a state and produces an observation that belongs to omega i. And then we have, finally, we have a cost function, j i, which again, picks up a state of a robot, takes that action that robot is going to make from that state, and it gives you a cost, cost value. So this is the general navigation problem. Now I'm going to talk about social navigation. And this is, this is what I want to you know, focus on. This is really important because there's a lot of ambiguity and, and uh, confusion about what social navigation is. What I've seen a lot of people do, a lot of research, research uh, uh, literature do is they tend to conflate the notion of social navigation with navigation among humans or na navigation with humans around the robot. And I would argue that the latter is not really social navigation. Navigation or simply navigation, just navigating with humans around you is, is not social navigation. It's just a harder navigation problem, right? So just having a robot and seeing one human and calling it social navigation is, is uh, I would argue, not social navigation. And, that, and the problem is that's the best we can do. We don't really have a definition for social navigation up to now. And that is what I want to you know, uh, resolve in this in this is all over here. So here is, I propose a definition for social navigation through this construct of what I call social mini games, right? Social navigation, I'm still going to claim it does not have a real definition, but what we can do is define this thing called social mini games. And this is a lot of math, but I'm going to say it in English. So given the navigation tuple that we described in the previous slide, a social mini game occurs if for some time gap, defined by a comma b. So a comma b are time steps. So for some uh, time gap in, instantiated by a comma b, which, which is inside the horizon, finite horizon, there exists at least one pair of robots, i comma j, that for which all the preferred trajectories of i and all the preferred trajectories of j are going to be in conflict. Okay, that is all that this definition, definition is saying. So there exists one pair of robots, I'll repeat it because it's important. There exists at least, at least one pair of robots for which all the preferred trajectories of both robots are going to be in conflict during some uh, during some finite time, uh, a comma b, which is inside the finite horizon. Um, so the, I'm going to visual, I can visualize this using some examples. So on the left, we see two robots 
uh, one and two shown in green and red, right? And the arrows indicate the preferred trajectories. The shaded regions of the red and green indicate the, the, the conflict or indicate the overlap between the time, time gap of A and B. And here we're going to assume that each robot only has one preferred trajectory. So gamma I tilde one and gamma uh, two tilde is, is the, uh, the set size is one. So this is a social minigame. What is not an example of a social minigame? This is not a social minigame, what is on the right, because here, even though the agent's prefer set of preferred trajectory is still one, there's only still one preferred trajectory for each robot, but now uh, the robots are not going to be in conflict or these preferred trajectories are not going to be in conflict because uh, there, is, there, is, there is no time gap or there's no uh, time, time duration A comma B, which induces a collision or which induces an overlap between the preferred trajectories. So um, you can intuitively also think of it as follows. One, one is going to reach its goal long before two even reaches the point of intersection, right? So that's another way to think about it. Another way to think about uh, social meaning game is um, uh, using this another example. So here the left scenario remains the same. What changes on the right in the right scenario is that the, the number of preferred trajectories for agent two now increases to two. What this means is that agent two has two preferred trajectories. However, only one of them is in conflict. The other preferred trajectory is not in conflict with the green's preferred trajectory. So this again violates the definition of a social mini game because not all the preferred trajectories of one are in conflict with all the preferred trajectories of two. And this definition is, is powerful in, in the sense of two things. One, that it captures the multimodality nature of, of, human, of humans. Because humans don't really have a single preferred trajectory. They can have multiple trajectories, right? And the second thing that this definition captures is why, why we cannot call uh, just simply navigating in human environment social navigation, because if the environment is very open, right, then you will have, you may have multiple preferred trajectories, not all of which may be in conflict. So that is why if you have an open room and you may have like, you know, you may have a large number of humans that still might not be social navigation. So social navigation, this might seem like a very constrictive definition, but it actually captures a lot of scenarios like uh, navigating through a doorway, a hallway, a uh, corridor intersection, traffic intersections, uh, merging scenarios. So it actually captures a wide range of scenarios. And uh, using these social mini games, we can actually talk about social navigation. So uh, let me talk about um, the, the solution architecture. So the architecture, the object optimization um, objective that you can use to solve the navigation problem is as follows. And this is a very general, uh, very, very general optimization formulation. You can use MPC or any other local planner to solve this reseating horizon. And what this is saying is that we want to optimize over uh, the set of policies pi i. We want to find the optimal pi i star that keeps ro robot i as close as possible to its preferred uh, trajectory xi, xi t tilde. Right. So you have this. Uh, you have this uh, horizon uh, zero to t, and you want to make the robot keep the robot as close as possible to x i t tilde. And this is the GIF is the cost, the terminal cost at the last time step. For the constraints, uh, they are also somewhat straightforward two parts. The first constraint two a is a collision avoidance constraint. You want to say that the uh, configuration spaces of i and j should not overlap at every time step. Two b is a transition dynamics constraint. Uh, respecting the kinodynamic constraints. And then 2C and 2D are the uh, uh, two-point uh, boundary value boundary value constraints. Like you start from goal, start from your initial point and you end at your goal. Um, this is a very you know, basic, basic solution architecture, but now there's a big problem. In general navigation problems, this, this, there, there are a lot of solutions. There's, there's a large literature available to solve, to solve this problem, right? You can use MPC, you can use DWA. But now when you talk specifically about social navigation or about social mini games in particular, there's a big problem. And the problem is that during this time horizon AB, which uh, appears inside this summation, right? We are saying that there exists at least one pair of agents, right? Assuming the social mini game holds, assuming this is a social mini game, inside the summation, there is, ex uh, there is essentially one, at least one pair of agents for which this XIT tilde and xjt tilde is going to be in conflict. So what that implies, if, if this definition holds, so what you can show mathematically is that this 
optimization will either not have a solution or will have a very, very suboptimal solution. And that is precisely why you see that, that, that either your robots will collide or they will enter a deadlock at a, let's say at, at, in a social mini game, like a doorway or a hallway. And it is, you can, you can trace its mathematical roots back to this optimization formulation because this XIT tilde and XJT tilde are going to be in conflict, right? So this is, this was the, how, how I'm formulating a social mini, uh, social navigation problem. And this is the, like the problem in the solution, uh, solu in the, in the solution, how you can derive the solution. So if I've, if I've been able to convince you so far as to, you know, what a social navigation problem is and what are the challenges in trying to get a solution for the social navigation, then I can, you know, uh, talk about some of the, some of uh, briefly about an approach that we are, uh, working on in, um, uh, to, to try and resolve this. So what I'm trying to, so what I'm, now what I'll say is that if you think of the trajectories or the preferred trajectories as like two strings, right? Two strings that are going through space and time, then topologically you can think of them as these strings as being entangled at, uh, during, during A and B, during two parts of the string, two strings, you can think of them as being entangled and you need to dis disentangle these two strings, right? In order to be able to, uh, uh, ensure that the, the, there is a non-zero solution set to this optimization problem. So I started working on this uh, bi-level optimization solution uh, towards the end of my PhD. And then I've been continuing it uh, in different, different application, different, different domains uh, in my postdoc as well. Um, so the references can be found below. So what we do is, and uh, because, you know, the, I won't go into the details of the solution because that uh, you know, it's a, that, that's more like a 45 minute talk thing. And in a 20 minute talk, I'll basically, you know, just sweep the details under the rug, but I'll give a high level overview of what, what it is. So we have a two stage optimization procedure. In the first stage, we use auctions or auction theory to, 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 to disentangle those strings. We, we basically have agents participate in an auction and we have them bid over a turn to move. So we are, use auctions to answer the question, who moves first? Right, because the conflict is that they arrive at this bottleneck and now they're stuck. Like, right, who goes first? Because each agent is self-interested. Each agent wants to uh, go first, according to their ob objective function. But that's the problem. Who goes first? So we use auctions that uh, applies an operation uh, over this XIT tilde, and it it changes the preferred path uh, for each agent in a way that uh, uh, that is acceptable to every agent. Every agent accepts a modification of their preferred path in a way that uh, the solution is still optimal or as close to optimal as possible. And the auctions answer this question, who moves when? So this robot moves first, this robot moves second, this guy moves third, and this guy moves fourth. This is the first, this is top level of the optimization. This then follows with the low level optimization, bottom level, which is the motion planning optimization. So once you have a turn-based ordering over the agents, then you can kick in the motion planning stage where now uh, this optimization optimization is feasible, and you can plan uh, optimal or feasible trajectories for for each robot, right? So instead of doing or instead of solving this in like in a single stage manner, we solve it in a double stage manner. We use auctions to compute a turn based ordering over the agents, which is acceptable to all all the agents, and then we follow it up with a bottom level motion planner uh, like MPC or DWA or RRT. So that that is that is you know. Um, a uh, type of approach or type of solution that that uh, we are currently exploring. Of course, this is not the only solution. You can think of other ways in order to to you know address this uh, address this conflict. Um, but uh, um, the main purpose of this talk, you know, is is if you're taking away one thing, it's like how you how do you form formalize this notion of social navigation and the main challenges that that come up in this uh, social navigation solution uh, scenario. Let me visually just uh, you know describe what the auction framework looks like. So you have three robots that are approaching this bottleneck, this narrow doorway, right? And their goal is on the other side of the doorway. We form this intermediate goal, and it is on this intermediate goal that we run this auction. So agents one, two, three participate in an auction, and uh, they decide that this optimal order is two, three, one. So agent two goes first, then three, then one, right? Then this is passed to, to each agent, and then the low level motion planning kicks in and they navigate through this uh, gap. So I wanna now quickly talk about results. We developed this simulator, multi-agent navigation simulator called Social Gym 
it is a nav simulator for multi-agent robot navigation in shared human spaces. So we, our thought process was like, okay, we formulated this social navigation problem. We came up with a possible solution. Now, how do we, you know, uh, take this forward? How do we uh, do experiments on this? So we also developed our in-house simulator that is specifically built for social navigation. It contains all of the scenarios that, I, that I've been discussing so far. It contains a doorway, hallway, intersection, and roundabout. And um, I, I won't go into social gym in more detail, but what it is actually, it is a uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning interface built on top of uh, a na local navigation stack, right? So you can do multi-agent RL, you can do local navigation, uh, you can do uh, human behavior modeling. So it's got a little bit of everything for everyone. So if you're a roboticist, if you're a reinforcement learning researcher, if you're a, a HRI researcher, so you, you can you can uh, you can play with this simulator. And uh, the link I'll post the link at the bottom as well. So now I want to show you the, um, in these social mini games, uh, how does a bi-level optimization work compared to let's say a, a baseline uh, like CAD RL, which uh, does the single stage optimization. So um, as you can see, like there is some sort of emergent behavior like a Q formation or a line formation on the left. Whereas on, on the right, there's a little bit of, you know, a conflict or collision happening uh, at the doorway and one agent doesn't even move, I think. So this is, this is, uh, this is, these are all experiments done in social gym. Uh, this is an uh, autonomous driving result. So here uh, on the left is our bi-level optimization and we have 8,000 vehicles uh, per hour. And uh, they're also using the same bi-level. They're do, doing the auctions at the top level and the motion planning at the low level. You compare this with a standard uh, traffic light or stop sign kind of scenario, and we can see that it, this is you won't, this is still not colliding. The, the, even on the right, it's not colliding, but it's very inefficient, especially as the density grows larger. Uh, one caveat here is that uh, here the agents are not decentralized; they're centralized. Like we are, we are, we are controlling all of these agents. Okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, move here a little fast because I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna show some real world results as well. So here again is the same kind of thing, bi-level optimization on the left versus a uh, DWA planner on the right. And uh, one thing that uh, to notice is that, you know, um, these are all autonomous navigation. Like we're not controlling, we're not controlling, manually controlling these, these cars. So these are F110 car platforms and they're all running autonomous navigation um, on them. So this is another uh, car experiment that we did. Um, this is an experiment uh, with the Spot and Jackal. Um, so we're comparing it with a Spot and a Toyota HSR because we didn't have the exact comparison with the Jackal using DWA. But uh, you can sort of see like a sense of, you know, what happens if you don't do some sort of explicit coordination over these robots uh, in these sorts of social mini games. Now, if you were to, you know, if you were to not have a social mini game, if you were to open up this environment, right, remove the, uh, the walls and the, these these tables and all these space con spatial constraints, then DW is fine. You can do it. You can do DW. Static obstacles will still work. Uh, not maybe dynamic, fast dynamic, but static obstacles will, will work just fine. But the moment you turn this into a social mini game, then these sort of problems come, come into play. So intersection again, you see one robot slowing down just enough to let the other robot uh, go first. And this is another um, intersection scenario. So uh, let me just talk about future work very quickly. Um, one of the flaws that like you might have you might have just come across your mind. One very big flaw is that the auction requires has this assumption that agents are going to participate in the auction. Now this might work for robots, right? But humans don't are not going to participate in the auction. So um, so what we have right now is is a distributed uh, system where you know. Um, Agents, agents need to know the turn-based ordering, like the output of the auction. You have this assumption that robots or humans are going to participate in an auction, but but this is these are all sort of restrictive constraints. So we want to move towards a fully decentralized system that can guarantee uh, safety and liveness, and that is currently what's something that we are working on. Um, another way to you know uh, ex uh, to 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 model these explicit cons uh, constraints and explicit coordination between agents. Uh, can be done using large language models, given the recent, you know, uh, the recent progress and the recent maturity in large language models and being able to do this, these kinds of things. It's an exciting, uh, you know, uh, possibility to see if we can use the progress that 
LLMs have made uh, till now, and can we use them in on a, in a robotic application sense? Again, uh, we need to be able to predict the intentions and the cost functions of the other agents, other robots. So can we use, so we know we have in, uh, inverse reinforcement learning, inverse optimal control uh, algorithm, but can we extend them to the multi-agent case? That is another direction that I want to work on. And finally, uh, my passion has always been in autonomous driving. I like fast cars. I like very rash cars. I want to, you know, uh, I want to continue my research in autonomous driving in, in unstructured uh, environments. I want to continue uh, things that I've been doing for my PhD and uh, and extend autonomous driving to you know India-like scenarios. Uh, so I've been a little bit active in in a lot of uh, DEI initiatives. So I've been so at Maryland. I've been you know participating in the AI for All uh, program. So in 2020 and 2021, I was uh, so in 2020 I was a guest lecturer, 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 and in 2021 I was a course instructor for AI for All. Um, I was also a TA for the NY AI School, um, also in uh, University of Maryland. Then at UT Austin, I, I um, uh, participated or was a volunteer for uh, the STEM. Uh, STEM Girl Day that happened, which 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 is like a huge uh, STEM event that organized like you know uh, fun physics experiments, fun science experiments, like a science fair uh, for for uh, 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 women and girls uh, of school age and college age to come and you know check out the experiments and to give demos to them. Uh, so I participated in this event, and then uh, in the near future, I'm going to be serving as a judge uh, on a panel for for an AAAI AAA sponsored event for. Uh, for, for for middle school students um, uh, for the Society for Science event. Um, and uh, even even uh, uh, moving forward, like I'm very interested in in in, uh, in in continuing exploring this dynamics and intersection between between uh, STEM outreach and robotics initiatives because I feel that there is a lot to be gained by demoing robots to young uh, students, young kids and getting them interested in science. I think I think there's no other, no better way to get people interested or students interested in science than to you know give them a live demo. So so demoing robotics and you know demoing robots and and to to young kids is, is what I what I'm interested in. That wraps up my presentation. I'm two minutes uh, overboard and I'm a lot I'm a lot over over time. So apologies for that. But if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask me or and uh, reach out to me over email or or other or the social media. Oh, okay. Thank you, Hohan, for the very nice talk. Um, uh, could you maybe quick, uh, shortly explain what is the way uh, going now from centralized control to, to fully distributed control planning? Right. So we all... Um... What I what I showed right now was uh, sort of distributed. You do assume like a like a like a like a central node that that uh, performs like the auction that takes in the bids from all the agents and then redistributes the uh, redistributes the turn based ordering. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I think uh, going towards a fully decentralized, you need to have. Um, a good sense of the the objective function, the cost functions of the other the other agents. So if you if you have a good idea of the objective functions of the other robots, then you can uh, go towards uh, fully decentralized. I think doing fully decentralized without knowing the objective functions of the other uh, robots uh, or the other agents is, is is very very hard. And I don't think there's a clear idea or clear uh, solution yet without. If, if you're not talking about heuristics, there are some ways to do heuristics and we're exploring some of those heuristics where you can uh, still do uh, decentralized um, uh, navigation. But if you want to do uh, like, like uh, decentralized navigation with some bounded with, with results with some bounded conf confidence, then uh, there are some works or there are, there is a research thread that is exploring uh, like a two thing, two step thing where you first use uh, in IRL or inverse optimal control to get an idea of the uh, objectives and intentions of the other robots. And then using that, you can then apply that to decentralized control. So that is one way you can, you can learn the objective functions 
or you can estimate the objective functions of the other robots. And then uh, you can apply, you can use that in a decentralized uh, navigation setting. Um, or uh, you can engineer your way out of this and uh, try to. Uh, uh, some heuristics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have here a question from in the chat. Uh, could you, uh, from Sarah Honava, could you please explain how you would consider other moving obstacles in the environment, such as humans in your optimization problem? Right. Uh, so that's a good question. So we don't have a good um, solution for humans yet. So right now what we've done is we've, or we've been able to demonstrate our algorithms on, on, on uh, robots. So it's right now we have multi-robot systems. So our next step is going to be uh, trying to invite, trying to get humans in the loop. And uh, one of the things that we need to now move forwards is uh, uh, we need to move away from the auction approaches that we've been doing so far because uh, you can't really expect humans to participate in auctions. Uh, so um, I, 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 we have been exploring a new idea using, using based on control barrier functions. I can't say more on that right now because it's still very preliminary research. But uh, we're trying to trying to think of some ideas, think of some work, or think of some 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 steps that can take us from pure multi-robot systems to multi-robot human uh, systems. But um, we're not quite there yet. We don't yet know how to model um, uh, model the humans or incorporate the humans uh, in in practical systems. So in simulation, we can do it. In simulation, uh, the human simulation the humans follow a fixed motion model like social forces or orca. So there we can do it because there we know the motion model of the humans, but we still have not found a way to uh, deploy that in real practical systems. So that is the part where, where we're currently stuck at. But simulation we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we don't have other questions. But uh, participants, since we don't have another speaker today, participants can stay around to talk with Rohan. We leave it open a bit. In the interest of time, let, let us thank the speaker so we can terminate the recording. Uh, thank you, everybody. If you have uh, any, any more, um, if, if you want to learn more about the Future Leaders uh, seminar series, please. Uh, follow the link on the screen right now um, to, to get more information, uh, nominate other participants, and access some of the recordings of the videos, uh, the presentations that we've had throughout the semester.